Hello, in this video, I'm going to create a spectral distortion patch using Max MSP. Spectral distortion is a technique that can be applied in many ways, but it mostly refers to taking the frequency content of an incoming audio signal and then distorting the relationships between those specific frequencies. This creates a very unique distortion where the audio content is kept the same, but the frequencies are shifting around, creating very interesting and unpredictable combinations. To understand this, we are going to look at FFT analysis, the PFFT tilde object, and how we can use the jitter objects, the visual objects in Max MSP to manipulate audio data. Let's get started. All right, let's start by setting up our audio playback environments. Now, this is going to be a live effect, but for testing purposes, I'm going to drag in or classic Anton.AIF sample built into Max. I'm going to create EasyDAC tilde for the audio output. And to control the gain of the incoming audio, I'm going to use live.gain tilde. So if I simply send my sample into live.gain and then I send a result to EasyDAC tilde, I can simply play back the audio. But that is not what I want to do, is it? I want to create a cool spectral distortion algorithm. So ideally, I would have something here that the audio would go into and then it cool stuff would happen and then I would have the nice cool distorted spectrally distorted signal that I would play exactly in this way. And of course, if I'm playing audio that I'm distorting, I should also use a peak limiter. So let me tilde with the argument two should go right before the outputs, just in case we mess something up and then there's a sound louder than it should be or louder than our computers can handle. All right, so then our question is, what is the cool stuff here? What is going to happen exactly? And to understand this, I think it's a good idea to split the process into three steps. So what do I want to do? Well, first I want to analyze the spectral data and put it into a container, right? That's the first thing I want to do. And then, and this is the cool stuff, I want to distort the container. I want to distort it in all sorts of different ways. And then three, I want to play the distorted container back. Right, so if I figure out how to do these step by step, I should ideally achieve spectral distortion in the way that I'm approaching it. So how do we analyze the spectral data? How do we analyze the frequency data of any sound that we are playing live or, uh, or through a sample? Well, one idea is to use an FFT analysis, right? I can use the PFFT tilde object to send audio, analyze it, do something with the FFT analysis, and then either send the results or do something else with the results of the analysis. FFT is a very complex subject. PFFT is a very complex subject. So for the purposes of this video, I'm going to try and tell you the relevant bits and pieces, but I have made a lot of tutorials on spectral processing. There are a lot of tutorials on spectral processing with Max on YouTube. So this is something you can definitely explore if this subject excites you. But for now, I want you to realize that there is an error. This object seems like it doesn't exist, but if I go to my Max console, it just says that the PFFT tilde object requires a patcher name argument. Well, it says that and it does that because this object on its own will not work. I need to create another max patch. I need to go to file and go to new patcher and I need to create a max patch that describes what is going to happen inside PFFT tilde. I need to save this new patch and then I need to tell PFFT tilde that it should load this patch inside it and only then it is going to work. Right, so let's make this a bit smaller so it kind of looks like it's contained in my main patch. So this means that we can create some new objects that are exclusive to PFFT tilde, such as FFT in tilde. This needs an argument. This is going to be the first inlet, so FFT T in tilde one is going to make sure my PFFT object is going to have a single inlet that receives audio. The FFT in tilde object is going to perform the FFT analysis, it's going to give me all sorts of nerdy information from these outlets, and then I can process it. And if I want to have audio coming out of my PFFT tilde object, I can simply create FFT out tilde 
and give it the argument one. So now it's going to have a single outlet. The first outlet is going to take in some mathematical nerdy data, it's going to turn it back into audio that we understand, and then it's going to send it out from its outlet as a nice signal. All right, let's save this guy. And I'm going to call this um, distsfft.maxpad, distsfft.maxpad. I'm saving this in the same folder as my main spectral distortion patch. That's important. distfft.maxpad, I've saved it. I can close this guy and now I can go back to pfft and I can give it an argument, distfft. And there we go, now it is an object. I don't have any errors here. And as we expected, it has one inlet and one outlet. And both of these guys are going to take in or send out audio. So I can simply do this. Of course, if I do this now, nothing's going to happen or I'm going to hear a bunch of clicks and uh, my computer's going to crash and I will have to restart recording this video, which is not something I want to do. So maybe instead I can lock the patch, double click on PFFD tilde, click that little modify read only icon here, and then again, click the unlock button and start editing the contents of my PFFD tilde patch. Now let's consider what we want to do. The analysis part is already done by the object itself, right? So FFT and tilde is going to send me or give out three bits of information that's very relevant to FFT analysis. The first outlet is going to send out the real inputs. The second outlet is going to send out the imaginary input and the third outlet is going to send out the FFT bin index. So perhaps it's good to understand initially what this FFT bin is. And to understand this, we have to consider an extra argument that we need or we could use for the PFFT tilde object. And that is the FFT size. The FFT algorithm works through taking in an audio, taking in an audio signal or any kind of signal, splitting that into chunks, that is what the FFT size is going to be, chunks of samples and then and to analyze all of those samples together to figure out which frequency ranges are more or less strong in the analyzed incoming signal. Now, the size of those analyzed chunks is expressed through the parameter of FFT size. And for nerdy mathematical reasons, this has to be a power of two. Right, so I'm going to type in 1024, 1025 is not a power of two. But in any case, this number has to be a power of two. The larger this number is, the more resolution we have in our FFT analysis, right? So if it's important to you that the analysis is very, very, very clear, you want a larger FFT size, but this is also going to be the latency of our FFT process, right? So the incoming signal will be sent out 1024 samples later. So if you want less latency, then you should lower your FFT size. I am happy with an FFT size of 1024, so I'm going to bring back up my FFT analysis sub patch. And now I can tell you that this FFT bin index is going to be one by one the bins of my FFT analysis, which is also going to be 1024. So whatever the FFT size is, the incoming audio will be split into chunks of uh, this many samples. And then the FFT analysis will be represented by bins, bits of information of uh, that exact size. So this outlet is going to send out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and all of those cool wacky numbers up until 1024. And while that is being done, with each FFT bin index, I'm going to get these two numbers. I'm going to get the real input and the imaginary input, which do not mean anything intuitively uh, understandable to us, right? So we have to convert this information to something that makes a bit more sense. And one way of doing this is to treat these numbers as Cartesian coordinates and to transform them into polar coordinates, which can be done through the Cartopol tilde objects. So I can just plug in these values here. And then the first output, uh, the first outlet uh, is going to give me the amplitude of uh, whatever bin that is being sent out through these outlets. And the second outlet is going to give me the phase of the analysis, the phase of the result of the analysis. And this does mean something to us, especially the amplitude refers to how strong uh, the analyzed frequency bin is the 
higher the value here, the more strongly the that frequency or that frequency range is present in the analyzed signal. That is something we can record and that's something we can play around with. And once I'm done, again, doing uh, cool stuff here, I can es eventually reverse the process. I can use pole to car tilde, convert things back to Cartesian coordinates, and then I would again have my real output and my imaginary output, and this is what FFD out tilde would require. So technically, technically, we have analyzed the spectral data. Well, we didn't do the analysis. The algorithm is already built into the PFFT tilde object, but now we understand how to set it up and how to get the relevant information. Now we have to put this into a container, and I am going to use a jitter matrix for this. You might be thinking, well, jitter matrices, these are for images, these are for video, what business I have doing this with audio information. And you would be right, we could record this information into an audio buffer and play around uh, with the information in that way. But since I am going to be distorting the information, and since I'm going to be using processes of distortion that I would normally use for images and video, I would prefer to record information in a jitter matrix. This does lead to some interesting results, a unique sound in my opinion, that is very fun to play around with. So if I'm creating a jitter matrix, uh, I should give it a name. This is not always necessar necessary, in this case it will be necessary, and I'm going to name this guy, and I can name this anything, right? I'm going to call it this thing. This is going to be the uh, jitter matrix that's going to contain the data that is going to be distorted. And then I need to tell it how many planes it's going to have. So how many bits of data, how many pieces of data each cell, each element in my matrix is going to contain. And I know that I'm going to have two pieces of data, right? I'm going to have the real input and the imaginary input, or better said, I'm going to have the amplitude of a frequency bin and I'm going to have the phase of the frequency bin. So there are going to be two plates. Then I need to type in float32. This is the data type of the jitter matrix. And float32 essentially means is floating point numbers. It's values uh, between zero and one and anything in between or anything more than one or anything less than zero. And finally, I need to know the dimensions of my jitter matrix. So is this going to be a single cell? Is it going to be 20 cells? Is it going to be 150? 500,000 million, I, I don't know, this can be a lot of cells, uh, but I need to tell it to the jitter matrix. And here I have a problem. For now, I'm going to type in one, so this is just going to have a single piece of information contained within it. But I want maybe 1,024 uh, cells in my jitter matrix, right? But I have two problems here. So first of all, this number can change, right? So maybe when you use this, you will want less latency, and you will say, well, maybe this should be uh, I don't know, 512, or maybe you will want a higher resolution in your analysis, and you will say, well, maybe this should be 2048, right? Or maybe you're going to do something completely different. So it's good if we m implement some kind of algorithm in our patch that can react to different FFT sizes uh, when we initialize our PFFT tilde object. And a good way of doing this is to use the FFT info tilde object. This object has four outlets and it's going to send out information about the uh, FFT analysis each time this PFFT object is loaded. So each time you load the patch or each time you reinitialize your PFFT tilde object, you're going to get the FFT frame size, the spectral frame size, that's important, I'm going to get to that in a second, uh, the FFT hop size and the full spectrum flag. Those are not important. What's important is this spectral frame size. Because even if we do this, we have yet another problem, and that's the fact that regardless of what our FFT size is, we only need half of the resulting information. We only need half of the bins. And why is that? Well, that's because the analysis is going to look at frequencies from zero up to and including our sampling rate. So in my case, it's going to be from zero to 48,000, but I don't really need information about frequencies above 20,000. First of all, if you know what foldover is, there's going to be foldover. And secondly, I won't be able to hear those frequencies anyway if I magically do not have foldover, right? So for this reason, 
uh, this FFT info tilde object is going to send you the spectral frame size, the uh, which is going to be always half of the FFT frame size. So I want to take the spectral frame size and I want to dynamically make that the dimension of my one dimensional jitter matrix, right? So I can simply use prepend dim. If I do this, I can visualize the results using a message box, the message going into the second inlet, I can send a bank to FFT info. And now nothing happens. Why? Because I'm editing, I'm editing this, I have to save this patch, I have to close it, I have to reinitialize my PFFT patch, if I go in here, and would it work now if I send it a bank or not? Let's see. Yes, it will work now. Uh, so yeah, in this case, look, it's, it says dim 512. And why dim? Why am I prepending this with the message dim because it needs to go into JIT matrix and dim followed by an integer number is going to change this one into whatever this value is. So now, after I do this, I am going to have a jitter matrix uh, that has the name DISTY that has two planes that is of the data type float 32 and is 512 cells long. That is going to be the dimension of my jitter matrix. All right, and now since I have this, I can also write information into this matrix, right? And this might be a bit tricky because I have a signal here and I want to write things into a jitter matrix, but there is an object that helps us with this called jit.poke tilde, which will let us write an audio signal into a matrix. Though for it to do that, I need to tell it a few things. I need to tell it the name of the matrix, which is this T. I need to tell it how many, uh, how many, yeah, how many, dimensions is yeah what the dimension is right yeah that's the second argument so i'll type in one right so because this has uh, a dimension of one this is a uh, one dimensional matrix no matter the if this dimension is one or 512 it's never one by two it's never 10 by 10 it's always a single number the dimension is always defined by a single number so it's a one dimensional matrix and finally the plane well, it has two planes, but I don't need to tell it if it has two planes. I need to tell jit.poke which plane of this matrix should it write things onto, right? And zero is the first plane, you know, it's the classic computer sciences thing. We start counting by zero in some cases, and in some cases we don't. But long story short, I need this pair of objects, jit.poke tilde disty one zero and jit.poke disty tilde disty one and one. The first one is going to take in the value to write into the matrix, and then it's going to take the uh, the coordinates in which to write this incoming information. The second one is going to do the same, and the only difference is that the first object, one, zero, is going to write things into the first plane of my two-plane matrix, and the second object here is going to write things into the second plane of my two-plane matrix. Now the question is, well, that's all great and all, but how do we figure out the coordinates, right? Because in this specific case, my jitter matrix is 512 cells long. So each bits of information I'm writing, I should tell this object uh, the coordinate to which cell out of the 512 possible cells I'm writing the information into. And this is really easy because that's what the FFT bin index is telling me, right? It's going to start counting from zero and it's going to give me index of the first bin, information about the first bin, index of the second bin, information about the second bin, and so on. So what I will be doing is index of the first bin, information about the first bin, this is written into the matrix for the first cell, which will contain the first bin's information, then the same thing happens for the second bin, and now it's written into the second cell, and so on, and so on. Now, we can try to visualize this, right? Maybe it's a good idea at this stage. And what I will do uh, to visualize this, I'll create an out object and I'll give it the argument two. So the second outlet of my PFFT sub patcher is going to contain, uh, it's going to send out this jitter matrix, but I also need to send the bank, right? This jitter matrix is not going to send output on its own. I need to send it a bank. So for now, to keep things simple, I can also create the 
object in one. This might be a bit confusing. The in and out objects differ a bit. Uh, in one would be the second inlet of PFFT tilde, but out two would be the second outlet of PFFT tilde. In any case, I can send a bank here and then whatever is in here, it can be sent out like this. And then from outside of my PFFT uh, tilde sub patch, I can look at the results of my analysis to see if it really works. Let's save this. I'm going to close this. I'm going to reload my object. And look, now we have this new outlet. We do not have a second inlet though. So maybe I was wrong with what I was just saying. Uh, let's go back in here. Yep, I was wrong. That was not correct. Apologies for the misinformation. This should be in two as well. Let's save the patch, close this, reinitialize the object once again, and voila, now we have two inlets, two outlets, and a special uh, message outlet to of this FFT. Oh, now I get it. Okay, now I know what the problem is. I wasn't only wrong, but it was even worse. I was backwards. Out one would be the second outlet of PFFT tilde because it needs to be a separate outlet, but in one would uh, share the same inlet because the same inlet can receive audio and messages. In any case, if that is confusing, apologies. Uh, we need into and out one in order to have, there we go, the second inlet and the second outlet of PFFT tilde. Let's for the final time save this fix everything. There we go. All right, there we go. So second inlet, second outlet, I want to send a bank here and I'm going to receive, I'm going to use jits.p window to visualize the result. I'm going to receive a jitter matrix, which will be visualized through jits.p window. Let's see what happens. All right, we're going to play the audio. There is no audio output because we did not define this in our PFFT tilde object. But if I click this button, look at this, I'm getting a bunch of nice images. And if you have a good eye or if you have done this before, you might notice that the green color corresponds to the division of the frequencies and the purplish pinkish color corresponds to face. I guess kind of see it go up and down as the audio is evolving, you might hear in the background me just clicking on the mouse, on the mouse button constantly. That is something we are going to fix. But all right, we have done the first thing. We have analyzed the spectral data and we have put it into a container. Let's delete this here as well. Oop, there we go. All right, so this is done. Now, how are we going to distort the container? Well, let's go back into our PFFT tilde sub batch. Now we are going to perform what is called a jitter matrix distortion. I, I believe I've done a video on this before. Uh, this is visual distortion. So I will try to again, explain this as fast as I can. Might take a while, but let's see, it's going to be fun in any case. To distort this, I need to create some kind of information with which to distort this matrix. And for this, I'm going to use jit.bfg, which is going to create all kinds of cool visual patterns. Uh, I need arguments just like how I had arguments for jitter matrix. So the amount of planes, let's make this match uh, what we have. Uh, or yeah, let's actually just have a single plane, the data type should stay the same. And for now, let's give it a dimension of 100 by 100. For jit.bfg, I do need an extra attribute called basis. And this is the kind of visual noise, the kind of uh, basis function it is going to use uh, to generate this output. And we can use noise dot simplex. There are other options you can explore and you can look at the reference of this object if you want to. But I just want my good old simplex noise. To visualize the output, let's again use jit.p window. And let's send this object a bank. There we go. A nice visual pattern, right? Uh, it's a bit random, but it's not too random. There are gradients as we go from uh, one area of our 2D field to the other, right? Uh, and if we want, we can make this one dimensional as well, right? So instead of being 100 by 100, it's just 100 cells long. And again, you can see that the values are random. There is some kind of gradient increase here and a little descent here and goes back into the black color. Now we can send other messages to jit.bfg to customize the output, right? So for instance, I can use the scale message 
accompany it with a number to change the size of, of the output. So uh, how, yeah, it's kind of like zooming in and zooming out onto this infinite field of random values. And to make this a bit easier, let's use this. I'm going to create a Q Metro object. This is just like Metro, but uh, if the computer is being stressed too much, it starts sending out bank slower. So if timing is not important, I prefer to use Q Metro. Let's give it 33 and then let's set the active attribute to one. So now I'm going to get banks every 33 milliseconds. And now look at what happens if I change the scale. All right, so this is what I want to do. And what I can also do is to give this generation an offset. Offset dollar sign one. I put a little message box here, a floating point number box, apologies. And if I change the object, instead of zooming in, it's like I'm scrolling through this field of endless random values. And this is how we are going to change these values further on. Or right, I'm just endlessly scrolling through the random values. This is a very cool method for generating interesting visual patterns. Okay, right, so uh, this is more or less how JIT.BFG works on a very basic level. But now what I do want to do is to take the results of my analysis, so take this guy, and I want to use this as some kind of distortion map, right? I want to take this and say, well, kind of shift the contents of this guy around, you know, like kind of stretch it to the left, stretch it from the middle, stretch it to the right, based on information in this matrix, right? So maybe if the if it's more white, if, there, if the values in this matrix are higher, then shift things to the right, if it's really dark, if the values are go below zero, and this is actually more or less between minus one and plus one, well, if it's less than zero, if it's this black area, shift things to the left, and if it's zero, do not touch that area of this matrix. In order to do this, I'm going to use JITGen, which you might know as the sub-programming language in Max. JITGen specifically lets us manipulate jitter matrices uh, using more intricate algorithms. If I create JITGen, I can do something like this, right? I can take this in and I can then take this in. So left is the matrix I want to distort, right is the uh, more or less a distortion map, and the output is going to be the distorted jitter matrix, which we are later going to read back. If I lock this patch and double click on JITGen, here is my tiny, tiny JITGen patching environment. So now we are really doing maxception. We are in a patch, in a patch, in a patch. That is hopefully not yet in another patch. Okay, now this world is a bit different, just like PFFT tilde is the same environment, but there are some extra objects we can use. And one of those objects is called sample. This is going to sample the incoming matrix, right? So I can send whatever's coming in through the first inlet into the first inlet of sample, right? So this guy goes into sample, and then the second inlet should contain the coordinates for each cell to sample from. So each cell, each cell here, each cell here I'm telling, you know, you don't have to be your own value. You can take this entire image and, you know, you can maybe be this value and you can maybe be this value or you can be your own value. You can, you know, take in a coordinate to figure this out. And that coordinate is going to be the second inlet. And how I want to do is I want to create an object called norm, which is the coordinate of the cell that is being processed itself. Right, so here, if I don't do anything, I'm just going to get the same incoming image. I'm kind of doing this redundant process where I'm saying, take the image, look at your own coordinate, and whatever is in your own coordinate, give me that, which is what was already happening when the thing itself is there, if that makes any sense. But now what I can do is I can kind of mess with this norm value, this coordinate, before sending it into sample. And for this, I can use into, that is going to be this jit.bfg, the output of jit.bfg is going to go into here, right? So perhaps I can use the plus object, the plus operator as it is sometimes called in jitgen, and I can offset it by this, right? So whatever your coordinate is, you know, look at the corresponding value, right? So if it is this specific cell in my uh, 
FFT matrix also look at this cell in the output of JIT.BFG and use that as a guide for offsetting your own lookup coordinate. Right, and that can be perhaps the result of sample. And one further thing I can do is to also change the effectiveness of this distortion through a parameter. I can use an object called param, which again does not exist outside of JITGen, or at least it does not exist in regular Max MSP programming environment. But here I can create an object called param and then I can give it a name, let's call it amp, because we are kind of amping the distortion up. And I can say, well, by default, this should be zero, right? And then I can say, well, whatever this parameter is in my JITGen patch, multiply the values coming in through in the second inlet by this, and then add it to my coordinates as the offset, then use it as a coordinate for looking up your value uh, as you sample the in input, the first input, and whatever that is, that should be the output. All right, so that's a mouthful for what seems to be a simple patch. There we go. All right, so let's try to play around with this before we go back into audio. Let's see if this really works. And how we can do this is, let's do it like this, out two. So I'm going to create the second and third outlets. The second outlet is going to be the matrix I'm not distorting. The third outlet is going to be the distorted matrix. And then I'm going to create a yet another, a third inlet which is going to be messages to my jits.bfg object, right? So I don't need these anymore. This can, these can be here. And if this is confusing to you, it will all make sense in a second, don't worry. This is in two, this is in three, and this is out one, and this is out two, perfect. This is what I want. I want to send messages to my distortion jitter matrix from outside. I want to send messages to my jit.bfg from outside and I want to have these two outlets showing me the results of my distortion jitter matrix and my distorted jitter matrix. Whew, all right, let's save this. Let's see what happens. Okay, save this. I'm reinitializing my PFFD tilde. Whew, all right, so this third inlet is now going to be messages to my .bfg. Ooh, there's something else I should be doing. I should also make the dimensions of my jit.bfg dynamic as well, right? So I'm going to do this. The dimension, the dim message, now not only goes into my distortion jitter matrix, but it also goes into my jit.bfg. So instead of 100, this will be 512. So the sizes of these two matrices are going to match. All right. Now, I don't care about audio. I'm not going to hear anything, but I am going to get this constant output, right? Uh, one more thing I should be doing, and apologies for constantly going back into my PFFT tilde object, but I'm kind of figuring it out as I go along. I need yet another inlet for messages that go into my JITGen object, right? Because I need to send it messages like, uh, you know, change this amplitude parameter from zero to something else. And I do this by sending that message, amp, and then the value of amp to the first inlet of my JetGen object. That's going to be the fourth inlet. Oh my God, there are so many inlets here, but it's going to be all nice in the end. There we go. Amp, dollar sign one. Okay, Whew. let's try this again. Here we go, we are playing this. I am constantly getting output. I can again auto automize this by using the QMetro object, let's do the same thing. There, now it's live. Uh, I'm going to do the distortion once, but I'm going to change the amp here. And I want you to look at these two outputs, these two outputs who, that are the same right now. I want you to look at what happens as I change this amplitude value. Again, we are not hearing anything. That's going to happen a bit later, right? That is the third step. But I think you can very clearly see how the information here is being distorted by whatever is contained in our JIT BFG object. This is happening procedurally. We don't have a lot of control over this, but it is consistent. 
I can change the scale, I can change the offset, I can send the bank to this inlet, the inlet that goes to JPFG. And again, I can play around with the amp value to change things. All right, so we have technically achieved distortion. We have distorted the container. Done. Whew, all right, now we have to play the distorted container back. This is the third and last step. Uh, before we actually hear the results of our spectral distortion. All right, so let's turn the audio off and let's head back into our PFFD tilde object. Okay, now what do we have to do? Well, I essentially want to read the result of my uh, process jitter matrix, or whatever's coming out of JITGEN. I want to turn it into a signal and I want to feed it into pole to car uh, tilde, right? So that the amplitude and phase information turns into the amplitude, uh, sorry, the amplitude and phase information turns into the real output and the imaginary output. Now, to do this, let's see, I would need to create yet another jitter matrix, which would be a separate container for playback, right? Because I will need a named matrix to read from to turn this information into audio. And let's call it play E. I don't know. I don't know if that's the right way to spell this. This is this thing. This is play. It's going to play. It's eventually going to be played, right? I'm going to send the output of JITGEN, whatever is created through JITGEN, to the input of uh, my play E jitter matrix. And if you send a jitter matrix, a matrix is just going to, you know, just contain that matrix. So now this is the result of my JITGEN distortion process. Okay, well, we had jit.poke, and now we can brace ourselves for jit.peak, which is more or less the same. It is just going to read a jitter matrix uh, as an audio signal. So it's the opposite of jit.poke, actually. We again need to give it the name uh, of the matrix that we are going to read from. We need to tell it what the size of this uh, matrix is, what the dimension uh, of this matrix, and it has a single dimension, right? Uh, it's uh, it's never 10 by 10, it's never 100 by 100, it's always just this nice row of cells. And then I need to tell it which plane to read it from, and it's the same game as before. Here it was zero, here it is one, there. So this is going to read the, um, the, phase, uh, the amplitude information, and this is going to read the phase information. And I only need one thing. There are only there is only a single inlet for these objects, which is the coordinates from which to read the information. And now look at this. We already have the coordinates. We already have this FFT bin index information here, right? And this is going to count from zero up until uh, you know however many FFT bins we have. So I can just plug this here as well. And now this is looking a bit ugly. I can clean this up later, but right now. In the heat of the moment, I know what these objects are doing. I know what these connections are doing. And I can see that it sends me a signal value, so whatever is read, and there is this dump out outlet that we can just not worry about. All right, so simply, I need to do this. There we go. So now, whatever is in play will be read, turned into audio, will be converted into the right information for FFT out tilde, and FFT out tilde is going to send it out as, uh, as a good old signal that we can hear, hopefully, uh, with a nice spectral distortion applied to it. I do have a problem, though, uh, which is the fact that we used Q-Metro, still here, to trigger these jitter matrices, but Perhaps I should find another way of triggering and sending out these matrices. Actually, I don't need to delete these inlets, but I need I do need to find out a way to constantly send banks to these objects in my F PFFD tilde patch uh, that perhaps does not use QMetro. Perhaps it is synced with uh, whatever values are coming through my FFT analysis. And I'm going to use a trick to do this. I'm going to create the object equals equals tilde with the argument zero. If you don't know what this object is, it might look a bit confusing, but essentially this object is going to take in or a 50 bin index. And if it exactly equals zero, this signal will contain one. If it does not exactly equal zero, AKA if it's not the very first bin, it will send out a zero, right? Because it is not zero, meaning zero, or it is zero, meaning one. I will then use edge tilde to uh, detect the changes from 
0 to 1 to 0 to 1 to 0 to 1. And then I'm going to use the first outlet where a bank, an actual bank message is sent if I go from 0 to 1, right? Which means at the beginning of my uh, FFT analysis, each time my the chunk of samples are analyzed and FFT and tilde is beginning to cut, starting to count from 0, I'm going to get a bank at that rate. Plus or minus timing. I, I don't know if this is really works, but I think this is going to do what I want it to do. And this can also go into jit.pfg. There we go. And I think, again, we are going to test this now. If I do it this way, then I am going to automatically get uh, the output of these matrices without me having to use a QMetro object to constantly send banks. Okay, I realized I forgot to add something here that's very important that has a big effect on the perceived quality of the resulting sound. Uh, it is convention to use these objects when you take the face of the analysis, right? Uh, so the phase output goes into frame delta, that goes into phase wrap, and that is the thing we write into the jitter matrix. And when we read, when we read this phase information, we use frame acum tilde in order to kind of turn it into the right kind of data. Uh, why that is, is not within the scope of this video. It's not super important right now, but using these objects as you deal with the phase of your FFD analysis, does result in a better, more crisp or a less crisp sound. So having done this, let's again close this. Uh, oops, let's close this. Let's reinitialize our object and let's see how things sound. So I have my amp uh, set at zero, so there should be no distortion. I and I should more or less hear my Anton.AIF sample. Nope, there's... We have a slight distortion throughout this entire process, but this is more or less Anton.AIF. Now, what happens if I increase the amp value? Beautiful. And you can kind of follow what is happening here, right? You can see that this green part is slightly more shifted than the, up, the green part of the upper matrix, which is the original analysis. I can change the scale for the amount of variation in the distortion, and I can just play around with the offsets in order to scroll through all the possibilities of my distortion. And the fun part is, this is all procedural, right? So it's both very predictable and very unpredictable. As you give this guy random offsets, you are going to hear sounds that are specific to that offset and those settings, but we will probably never predict how it's exactly taking place. And we can try this with other samples. So for instance, here is a bell sound. Sounds nice. I can start playing around with the frequencies of the spell sound. Beautiful. Or I can take, I don't know, some kind of drum loop, right? I can put a drum loop here, turn the amp down to zero, and here's a nice drum loop. It's almost like we are filtering it. But what we are actually doing is we are shifting around the frequency content of the incoming sound in all kinds of different ways. So there you have it. We have successfully played the distorted container back and we have achieved spectral distortion. Now, this can just be the beginning, right? Just using this, you can create all kinds of interesting sounds uh, that is both predictable and unpredictable at the same time using this procedural distortion. However, I do want to point your attention towards this. We do not have to use jit.bfg, any kind of distortion, any distortion method you can apply on this jitter matrix is going to be reflected in the sound. So if you really want, you can create uh, something that takes the webcam information or some kind of imaging or some kind of video in and uses and it uses that to distort the data contained in our disty 
matrix right here. So using this, you can create interactive applications as well as just pure procedural explorations of the distortion of the frequency spectrum. In any case, I hope this was interesting and useful to you. I hope you create some cool sounds and music using this. And thank you for watching.